<laughs> I just love that character. Um, so yeah, before we talk about the main topic of the the chapter, um, which is which is titled "Fishing in the Right Places," I actually want to draw your attention to what we just read, the final few verses of the chapter, John twenty-one. Verses 20 to 25. And it says, I titled it, John, you will be missed because I love this self. I don't know, glorification or hidden self glorification. It says, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is always how he referred to himself. Um, and it's talking about, you know, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And so the saying spread among the brothers. That this disciple was not to die, yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? And then he's, then he's referring to himself again, and he says, this is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things, and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true, you know, obviously. Um, I just love that. Uh, we've been, I've found so much joy recently in observing the character of Jesus in the passages we've been reading uh, recently in Sunday services and um, connect group studies and in my own personal reading. But, and what I've been noticing about Jesus more than, more than ever now is his confidence and assurance in, in who he is and what he is and the knowledge that he's done no wrong. It's particularly been coming up in the times where he's been judged by Pilate and King Herod and whatever. Um, and it means he, he commands a much higher level of respect than those he interacts with, of course, and it was, it was a respect that often wasn't actually afforded to him. That's not to say that I think Jesus lorded it over his witnesses, um, but I do love his character. I, I, I love that facet of Jesus' character, and this facet of John's character is another thing I love. Um, and then the final verse of the chapter, um, says, now there are also many other things that Jesus did, where every one of them were to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Isn't that just insane? Um, if you really think about it, that's just insane. But that's not the topic of the sermon today. The topic of the sermon today is evangelism, as it has been, and it's fishing in the right places. Anyone recognize that photo? Green Hill Lake. Green Hill Lake. Good, good. good. I, I didn't know if you would be able to. Grace and Phil might be in that corner. Right <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but no, yeah, that is Green Hill Lake in, in Ararat, or just out. Um, if you don't know it, me and Betty were walking there the other day, and Betty goes often with other people, I think. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful spot. And it's higher now than it has been in probably ever. Um, a long time. So picture picture that picture and you're you're out on the boat about here and you spot Jesus on the shore. Looks a bit like that. Something like that, right? <laughs> I don't know if he was wearing all white, he might have been. That might have been uh, difficult cloth to come by, but um, the question is, well, Jesus is stood on the shore, yet the disciples initially don't recognize him. John 21 verse 4 says, just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Now, if you want to give the disciples the benefit of the doubt, and you know, maybe you could say that they, they'd forgotten Jesus actually resurrected, they thought he was still dead or something. But this is after he's returned in, in a, you know, dramatic fashion. He walked through walls to return and show himself back to the disciples. That was in last week's chapter, correct? Yeah. And so Jesus was well and truly back. So, and it's not as if they had, hadn't heard of his arrival yet. And they, it also says later in the chapter that this was the third time he had shown himself to his disciples. But that begs the question, can, are we ever prone to not recognizing the presence and the influence of God? 
if the disciples, who had spent the best part of the last three years by his side, couldn't recognize, I don't know, his voice from a distance or his figure or maybe the beautiful white cloth that he was wearing, um, then surely it would happen to us. Then you consider this question. How close does Jesus have to come for us to notice him and let him have his way in our life? That's a genuine question. Think about it. Because in your life, in your experiences, how close has he had to come? How much has he had to reveal himself for you to notice he's there? Does he only have to drop a, you know, a little, a little message in there and you're like, okay, that's God, good. Or does he have to really bombard you and bang, that, bang down the door? To listen. I know personally, I'm very much the type to want to be self-sufficient. Um, and I'll tell you a story. When I, before I came, I'll speak on the, the topic of finances. Before I came to the UK, before I came from the UK, sorry, to Australia, I got the message and the call and the, the yeah, overarching message that I didn't need to worry about finances. That was something that came up to me, and I just I just had it in my head. God said to me, you know, you don't need to worry about finances. You're moving, you're moving across the world. Just don't worry about it. I've got you. And then that was confirmed by the wonderful, godly woman that is my grandma. You will, some of you, at least, most of you would have met her when she came and visited. And you can attest to her wonderful character. And she came and met up with me like a couple of days before I left. And she said the same thing without me mentioning it to her. She was kind of like, oh, I, I don't know, I just felt God was calling you to not worry about your finances. <laughs> what a blessing. Yes. But the, the thing is, I'll also, in that month, I had, I maybe had about, like, not much in my account prior to that. I was, I was still a teenager. Um, but on that month, I had so much come in and so much go out compared to what I'd previously seen. Because I was buying plane tickets and then I was getting given money and then da, da, da. and it all landed in the same spot and it was kind of like confirmation that like oh okay yeah God has got me for the next however long. Now I'll come to me moving to Australia. If you if you think about the provision of my job, for example, and the blessing of my house and being able to afford the house because of my job, and uh, also the God breathed route that I took to study in this last year, you, you would think surely I should be conscious of the fact that God has blessed me in, in the finances sector, no? But I'm prone to going, I'm prone to thinking, oh no, that was all me. That was shit, man. <laughs> it couldn't have been him. He came near and Said his, said his word, but I've either forgotten it or I've put it down to myself. I'm prone to, I'm prone to not recognizing the, the voice of God. And that's, and that's scary, for one. And it's something I need to work on. I'm preaching to myself just as much as I'm preaching to you. Um, we need to be more attentive to the movement of God in both the big things in our finances for a number of years or whatever, or in just our everyday lives. It could be in those those conversations and the invitations that we get to attend a social event or whatever. It doesn't have to be in this massive, glorious event of angels coming down from heaven that God speaks to us. God works wonders without our noticing. Imagine the wonders he could work if we noticed and cooperated. Let me move on now to the topic of the disciples, um, because they're crucial to my message today, and they're crucial to the story of John 21. And what's nice to know that is that in John 21 they do actually notice that you know I think it's the one who the Lord loved noticed that it was the Lord, and he said it was the Lord, and then was it was it Simon that dived in and turned him. And they also do listen to Jesus without knowing exactly who was instructing them to... They listen to his instruction to cast the net onto the other side. And I could preach a whole topic on that if I wanted to. But I'll save that. And Pastor Jay also preached last week 
on the value of believing even in the absence of cold hard evidence and how God, how God values that. So my question is a lot more simple. Does anyone know which of the disciples were the ones recruited while on the job as fishermen? If you look at these 12 disciples, you've got Simon Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, Simon, Thaddeus, and James and Judas. Which of the 12, I can give you a hint, there were four of them. So you've got a one in three chance if you just guess. Um, were the ones, you know, Jesus turned up and he said, he, he, they were turned up to fishermen and said, I want you to be my disciples. Any guesses? Is it Simon Peter and Andrew? Simon, Peter, uh, Andrew. Yeah. James. 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 Oh, uh, well, there were four, according to my research. It was, Simon wasn't actually one, initially, I don't believe, from the, from the research I've done. Um, it was Andrew, Peter, James, and John. And then, oh yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, and then Thomas, Nathaniel, and Philip, those were an extra three that were in the boat in John 21, and so they may well, well have had something to do with fishing or known about how to fish. But what's crucial is in Matthew 4 verse 19 and in Mark 1 verse 17, you see that the disciples were called to be fishers of people. Jesus said, come follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. That's so essential. It's essential to the message of the whole Bible and the whole gospel. And I'll come on to that in a second. But they were fishermen, and then they were called to be fishers of men. They were fisher, fisher people, and they were called to be fishers of people. Um, and then if you look at verse John 12, back a few chapters, verse 26 says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So that means that we are called to be disciples. So the disciples are called to be fishers of people, and we are called to be disciples, therefore we are called to be fishers of people. Correct? And then we come to the crux of, I mean, what I've been noticing is that just the crux of the whole gospel, is the Great Commission from Jesus in Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20. It says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That means, it, that first, first little bit, therefore go and make disciples, means that we're called to be disciples. And disciples are called to fish for people, and disciples are called to make disciples. So it's kind of a, a recurring cycle, a cycle of production that we're still involved in. I'd love to believe that every, everyone in this room is a disciple and is doing their best to make disciples in their lives. That's what I'm doing. Um, so, I, I, because this is the last uh, sermon on this topic of evangelism, I really want to get some active group work going on. And I've got questions, and the first few questions will be short responses, but I'd love for this might sound outrageous, but couples and families, can you split, not be in the same group as each other? So Tess and Mark, not in the same group as each other. We'll have, we'll have small groups of about four or five, I think we could make a few groups of that. Um, and the first question is, if, we, if we're taking the word fish as, um, as we, looking for people, making disciples, where are some places that you think of that someone can fish? Where can you go out and make disciples? Where in your life do you think of? Yes, yeah, into groups. Mix up, properly mix up, and I'll come adjudicate. Um, if you're not properly, if I see a couple that's in a group with each other.
fish. So where can you fish? Where are some places that you can fish? And again, it might not just be locations. In your surroundings? Um, Where do you live? Yes, I'm There are some key scenarios in the world where you can do that. I said I'm going to keep these short, so please, please wrap up that one because I've got a few questions to run through. Some will be shorter, some will be longer. But the last one will be the longest and it will be a proper response because this is the last term um, in this topic. Crazy how we come to the end so quick. All right, so what do we think? You guys seem ready to respond. Please hit me. Pass the J. Stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> guys, what's up? Where is the place that you can fish? Go on, Betty. Maybe you can fish in a place where there are like-minded people. A place where there are like-minded people. Okay. So, so for example, um, if I was Group, uh, so a support group of some sort. Yeah. That might be a good place for me fishing because those people have been through similar things to what I've been yeah. through and we can relate to one another and, yeah. and identify with one another. And that helps in terms yeah. of giving your testimony to be yeah. relatable. Mm. Yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, I might come back to you if you've got another one, but group at the back. Yeah, Maurice. Um, okay, workplace. Yeah. Workplace. workplace, okay, good. You stole my idea, but alright. Um, <laughs> I'm joking. That's, that's fine, yeah? Cool. Workplace? Anywhere else? Or, or what's important about the workplace? Why, why is the workplace such a good place to, to fish? You're there a lot. You're there a lot. You're up there often, yeah? Good. People know you, maybe? Yeah, yeah good. Guys at the front? Pete? Mark? Oh, we we'll just know what I said that there is uh, whenever we have a conversation with someone, you always looking for opportunity to talk to them. Yeah, whenever you have a conversation with anyone, yeah, just in general chit chat. Uh, yeah, good. You guys? When you share an interest with someone. Yeah, good. So that like-minded people. Yeah, you get to know them on a personal basis. And yeah, good. And you can work Jesus in. Good, yeah. <laughs> work Jesus in. Just slide them up and yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so I thought of locations. So some places that you can fish and some places you might feel called to evangelize are specific locations. So you might feel that Ararat, for example, is a, a location, a town that you feel called to evangelize in. Or it might be a specific, I don't know, the other side of the tracks, for example, that you might feel called to evangelize in. People groups, um, so it might say, you might say, I feel called to evangelize to old people or young people or whatever it might be, or men, or it might be marginalized branches of society, so maybe the, the poorest in our society or the least advantaged in our society, those are the people that you feel called to, to fish. Um, it might be a specific family, or it might be your own family, dun dun dun. Um, and yeah, it might be the workplace, or it might be uh, social events or something. I'm, I'm moving on quickly to the next question, is, how do we know which place is right? If we've picked up, or, or we've maybe had an idea of a place to go to, or it might be our workplace, or it might be another family, or something, how then do we know which place is right? Have a think, have a chat. I'll come back quickly. I'll only take like one minute. Um, I only really quick on this one.
Okay, okay. I gave you enough time to say about five or six words, so that should be enough. Um, <laughs> what do we think? How do we know which is the right place to to fish to evangelize? Guys, you guys are you guys are the best students. I love that. Um, Kevin, Kevin, what's up? I think um, it depends where you, where are you getting any results, and, and we try to hear God or two more. Yeah, hear hey God. Okay, that's always important. Good, good. You get results. Yeah, getting results. That was one. Yeah, that was one thing. I didn't know. I had to hear God part. I'm not going to that. Go on, Pete. Very good, very good. So that results thing, I, I agree with that, but also, yes, you said result, things can be temporary. And you might temporarily feel like it's the wrong place, but it turns out to be the right one. And he said, if you're not willing to like at least give it a go, you'll never find out. Good. Grace, you seem active. What, what were you saying? <laughs> you being told all the rest. No, 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 no. Positively <laughs> active. Just talking about, you know, wherever we are. Yes. Because um, that's basically our field, doesn't it? Mm. Um, or in the case of fish, that's our ocean. Mm. Nice. Nice. <laughs> it might have a lake. But within, say, a social group or something like that, yeah. that you're meeting with, you're meeting with people each week or you're living amongst people like there in the campground or something like that. You start to know who's closed off, yes. who what their thinking is, yeah. because you're getting to know them. Yeah. You can start to see who's anti and who's soft. Yeah. And I think the Holy Spirit sort of leads to that and he can yeah. and he leads you to say something. You know why? Because they're very small. Right. Yeah. But that's enough time to promote a, um, a conversation. Yeah, it sparks a conversation. Or else yeah. I just block it off. Yeah, you know, it's true. Good, yeah, and that's that. If you don't at least try, you'll never know one way or the other. Yeah, you'll just be left in limbo. Yeah, that's good. I think the crucial point of it all is, is listening to God, being attentive to God. We need to not just be checking our, our peripherals for God's influence, but also maybe looking out on the shoreline, on the horizon, and that's that comes to that temporary idea where we might think, oh, in the moment things aren't working and God's not helping me out in this situation, but he's just waiting for you to, for Thursday to come around, and Thursday's when it's all going to go forward. Um, even better than just checking if God is anywhere near us is training ourselves to seek and long for his presence and influence at all times. Uh, I've recently gone into Bible plans and I felt them to be really, really insightful and useful actually. And they've opened my eyes to the seemingly coincidental, I say coincidental because they're coincidental. Um, the call of God for that, it might be that specific week or that day or that however long the plan is or, or that year or whatever, whatever it might be. It just seems to always align. So get into the plans if you haven't already, or give them a go. I was also recently completing my credentials to apply to become a training minister with the CRC. Can I get a run? No. Um, and one of the questions that they asked me to consider was uh, how we hear from the Holy Spirit, like how the Holy Spirit actually moves us. And one of the things that I put down as my answer, or, or the answer that I gave was, it involved the Holy Spirit giving you a sense of peace about things. And that feeling where it just feels right, believe it or not, that might be the Holy Spirit, you know? Um, next question, and I, I realize I haven't got much longer, but the question is how exactly do we go about fishing? Now, I was in, I was in conversation with um, a fisherman I know actually, this, this is a true story. I was talking to a fisherman and I said, you're the expert on this topic, I'm preaching it on Sunday, what do I need to know? And he said to me, yeah, you're gonna to need to go fishing first and then, then you'll be able to know. So 
postpone that summer. I said, I can't really do that. It's kind of rostered on and timetabled in. So, uh, yeah, but he didn't give me any help. <laughs> but the thing is, I didn't need it because I'm an expert at fishing. What? I remember in my first sermon, jeez, in my first sermon, I put that embarrassing photo of myself from the Jerusalem in the, in the tunnels. This is even more embarrassing. And please, don't screenshot this or take a photo of this. Um, now, the, the, the famous pro- quote is a credit to a Credited to a couple of philosophers, um, and it goes like this: Give a man a fish. Stop it, Nathaniel. <laughs> Give a man a fish, and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, and you feed him for a lifetime. So, how exactly do we fish? Thankfully, fortunately, that's what we've been going over in the last few weeks, however long it's been, in this topic. So, if you want to look back at the sermons and find out how to fish or if you weren't listening the first time, you can find out that it's through friendship, or it's through events, or it's through service, or it's through power, or it's through personal holiness, or giving your testimony, or so many more. Um, and yeah, so that's how to fish, and I won't, I won't get you to chat about this. I will get you to chat about this though, quickly. Uh, is timing something to consider? Actually, no, I won't get you to chat about this. What I'll do, is I'll enlighten you with quotes from an amazing philosopher named Betty Voss. And I was on the phone to I was on the phone to her the other day, and and she said, if it's in God's timing, it's gonna bear fruit. Be mindful of where people are at and ask God for insights. This was yesterday. Um, do it prayerfully. We don't know everything, but God does. Have one ear tuned to God and the other ear tuned to them. So the person that you're evangelizing to. Isn't that just great? Betty should come and do this preaching. I also did a little bit of research on, on YouTube and I found this thing. And it's about how the moon influences tides and how that influences fishing. I, in, in theory, I knew that already, but it has a massive effect on tides and bodies of water. And, People go fishing on the days that they should, you know, to catch the best fish. So timing is important, and it is something to consider. And you don't want to rush into things, but also you don't want to push things further than they should be, or postpone them further than they should. If, it, if God's telling you, go now, go now. Yeah. Don't just think, ah, oh, but I'll wait another few days. Um, so the final question, and this is the important question, and I will give you a few minutes, this will be the end of my sermon because this is a time for response and genuine response. I want you guys in your groups to consider this question. Where do you feel called to fish? The, the, the beauty of these groups is that we can sort of hold ourselves accountable with the other people um, in these groups. You, you, you might say, say to these people, I feel called to to fish in this one family that's just entered my life, and I'm going to evangelize to them. A few weeks later, you can tell the people that were in your group, hey, I chat to them, and they're actually coming to church next week, you know? Okay? Yeah. How does that sound? Cool. So, yeah, have a chat, and just discuss with true application what we plan to do in our lives with regard to fishing in the right areas and evangelizing. Once that's done, I'll pray. I'll give you like at least five minutes. But please, everyone, try and uh, contribute.